Welcome and thank you for joining us for our topic today, Investing in the Age of Financial Impression. I'm Mike Breller and I'll be joined today by our Chief Investment Officer, Michael Dow. Um, the first thing we want to discuss today is really um, walking you through, um, and our, our goal for today is walking you through this era of financial repression and, and to highlight the implications that it has on investing uh, in a negative real return environment and in negative real interest rates and the, the impact that has on financial assets. Um, again, joining me today is, is Michael Dow. Uh, he is our chief investment officer. Uh, prior to joining Beacon Point, Michael was the head of um, US core bonds and head of sovereign credit research and also head of uh, emerging markets corporate debt at UBS Global Asset Management. Uh, he also uh, was a corporate bond manager at uh, PIMCO and uh, has a, a, a wealth of knowledge in, in this um, topic that we are presenting today. And so welcome, Michael. Um, uh, uh, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. I appreciate that. And uh, Mike's right. I, I, I've been thinking about this topic of financial repression for about a decade now. I first started thinking about it and getting interested in it. Uh, in the aftermath of the great financial crisis, and in particular around the time of the uh, LTRO crisis in, in Europe, where the European project seemed to, to be teetering on the brink because of a, a lack of a risk-free rate in, in Europe and the negative real interest rates that came out of the very, very low nominal rates. And the implications of negative real interest rates, which are your best uh, indicator that financial repression is being implemented, are, are legion. They're, they're very important, they're pervasive, and they have a lot to say about whether or not you should continue to uh, be comfortable investing in a traditional 60-40 portfolio. Negative real interest rates and financial repression, which go hand in hand, uh, throw your 40% of a 60-40 into um, at least um, it's the beginning of a conversation. It's very challenging to achieve objectives when a good component of the, uh, of the asset allocation is likely to be uh, seeing very, very low real interest rates, very, very uh, low, and in cases negative, real interest rates for a period of time. And that's where we find ourselves. So that's what motivates today's uh, webinar and the discussion. And uh, with that, I'd like to jump right into a conversation about, first, the lockdown and the stimulus response. We'll start there. That's, uh, that's where it all began without the lockdown and the stimulus response, we, we don't have financial repression or the need for it. The aftermath of all of the stimulus is what, what we're really trying to deal with here. The, there are consequences of all the money printing and all of the debt that's being issued to fund the stimulus, the fiscal stimulus response. And how do we deal with it? That is, if we're going to see massive US government budget deficits and we're gonna see an increase in the national debt, well, that has uh, implications for both the U.S.'s creditworthiness and our ability to deal with exogenous shocks. So we want to we want to make sure we can keep our debt levels under control. How do you deal with the mountain of debt that's been created? One answer is financial repression. And with that, let's jump right in. So we've had this lockdown. This is the Oxford University U.S. lockdown index, the orange line. Prior to February, we didn't have a lockdown. And by the uh, third week of March, we had uh, a near total lockdown of the US economy. The Oxford lockdown or stringency uh, index captures contain containment and closure policy. So school closures, mobility restrictions, et cetera. Also it captures uh, the, res the response such as economic policies that uh, will, will re replace the income that was lost and additional healthcare uh, system policies such as testing and investing in the healthcare infrastructure. So it does capture effectively the entire implications of, of COVID-19. And just to put a fine point on it, we saw the peak of the lockdown on April 13th, which now seems like a long time ago. Interestingly, the peak hospitalizations related to COVID just came a week later. We've seen a decline in both, which is very encouraging right up until the last uh, week of August uh, 2020. So while we're completely locked down, uh, it was necessary to do that to reduce the spread of the virus, but the consequences were a total and complete economic sudden stop, which is a phrase you generally hear associated with emerging market economies related to things like capital flight and a currency uh, uh, issue, a currency, a run on the currency or a run on capital. But we had it here in the United States to 
to try and contain through non-pharmacological uh, treatments the, uh, the spread of the virus. So we've seen reopening. We've had a little bit of a shutdown echo, and uh, it's all, it's all uh, moving in the right direction for now, but it doesn't mean we're going to go right from here from point A to point C without any hiccups. What, what was the economic consequences? What were they? Well, here's U.S. gross domestic product, GDP on the left and the U.S. unemployment rate on the right. And this is 70 years of data. There's a lot of data in these slides going back to the, uh, to the mid 40s. So the entire post-World War II period is encompassed by these charts. You can see that at minus, almost minus 32%, we've never seen a GDP outturn like this. We've never seen anything, any, anything even remotely close. If you do go back pre-1947 and look at some of the quarter on quarter annualized GDP numbers for the uh, Great Depression, uh, second quarter of 2020 comes in about fourth or fifth in terms of the worst quarter. There was a couple of years in the 30s that were worse, but since the, uh, the end of World War II, this is by far and away the worst economic outcome we've, we've seen. The other um, data point here on the right side is the unemployment rate, which now is back down to, um, to below 9%, 8.4% in the most recent number, which is an incredible recovery, but it did peak uh, back in the second quarter at nearly 15%. So these are massive unemployment numbers. Again, nothing like it in the post-World War II period. Staggering losses in both output and employment, but it appears uh, increasingly that the second quarter of 2022 is, is going to be the bottom. Why would that be? And the answer is because the government got on the case almost instantaneously. The first of the cavalry to arrive was the monetary policy authorities. The Fed lowered interest rates from going back now 18 months from two and three eighths to, to effectively zero. We're at the ELB or the effective lower bound right now. So it's rating, rate cuts to zero. That was the first step. We also saw an expansion of the balance sheet and I'll show you a chart on that in the next slide. But also repo operations, forward guidance and all of this alphabet soup of credit facilities that were designed specifically to avoid the fat tail of bankruptcies which would have caused a, uh, a literal depression. So it's no exaggeration to suggest that the Federal Reserve, through its uh, commercial paper funding facility, the primary dealer uh, credit facility, uh, the primary market uh, credit facility, and all of the other alphabet soup we see here, all of these credit facilities were designed specifically to save the bond market from complete seizure. And the reason that uh, it was important to save the bond market is if you have a, a liquidity event, and, uh, and companies are unable to roll over their debt in the bond market because the bond market is frozen or broken or closed, then the number of um, uh, bankruptcies would rise dramatically. And when, in a bankruptcy equity market, uh, equity holders are wiped out. So the equity market benefited dramatically from the Fed saving of the bond market. So the Fed saved the bond market and the saving of the bond market is what saved the equity market. And there's still, there's still tools they have available. Jay Powell said it on many occasions, he's ready to use the, the, the full range of the tools that are available to support the flow of credit here in the United States. And the tools, because they have a printing press, are currently seem limitless. How has the Fed balance sheet been brought to bear to provide assistance in the current environment? The answer is the Federal Reserve's balance sheet going back 10 years now in the aftermath of the great financial crisis used to be something on the order of 2 trillion. And it peaked at 4.5 trillion about uh, three or four years ago. And the Fed was embarking on a, a process of normalizing the balance sheet for the last two years, but that was interrupted by, by the, the great lockdown. And as a result, the balance sheet has exploded now from about $4 trillion in the, uh, uh, as of a year ago to almost uh, $7 trillion. And that's not all. The Fed has uh, unlimited ability to expand the balance sheet. The only caps or limits might be a potential loss of our reserve currency status, which I'll talk more about later or other kind of a currency crisis here in the United States, but we don't contemplate that. That is, that is currently not on the table. We could go to 9 trillion on the balance sheet. It could, it could grow another 2 trillion if necessary. It's our reserve currency status that gives us so many degrees of freedom in terms of monetary policy. Our ability to respond is much greater than any other countries. The reason we can do that is because uh, investors, foreign buyers will continue to buy treasuries and support US dollar denominated assets because we are the safe haven currency, we are the reserve currency. So it was an important feature uh, in our ability to respond to the lockdown using monetary policy. It was also important in our fiscal policy response. So you had this double barreled fiscal monetary response 
in an, an attempt to put a floor under the economy and cut off the fat tail of a, of a depression. The fiscal policy response began in the first week of March with an $8 billion phase one package. 100 billion in phase two came two weeks later, but it was the CARES Act or phase three at the end of March, which came, you have to admit, very swiftly in terms of how generally uh, legislation, the, the slow process of legislation in Washington, D.C. This was a, this was a warp speed uh, package of fiscal stimulus and, it, and, and the size of it is breathtaking. The biggest passage of a, a legislative deal done during the great financial crisis was less than 800 billion. And this was, this was four times as big, uh, three and a half times as big. So two trillion plus in, in CARES Act. We're probably, uh, we got a little top up in phase 3.5 a month later of just about a half a trillion. It's looking increasingly likely that after the, uh, the, the recess, that when Congress reconvenes, that they will pass a phase four bill. And, and the point is, if the economy and frankly, if politics allows it, we're going to get more fiscal stimulus because we have debt capacity as well. So we have monetary policy capacity because of our reserve currency status, and we have debt capacity also because of our reserve currency status. We are still able to issue debt and foreign buyers will continue to buy it, at least for now. But that isn't a given. That is more of a right uh, or a, it's a responsibility, not a right. And we need to be carefully considering what all the implications are of both the money printing and the debt issuance. So we've had an unprecedented lockdown and an unprecedented response. Just to put a fine point on how much three plus trillion and then maybe four and a half if we get a another phased uh, fiscal stimulus plan, what does it mean? This is a quarterly uh, uh, GDP annualized. It peaked at uh, nominal GDP in the United States, just under $22 trillion at the fourth quarter. Came in at uh, 19.4 trillion at the end of the second quarter of 2020. So total nominal GDP in the US is 19.4 and uh, that's about 5 trillion a quarter, just under 5 trillion. So three trillion looks like this. And if we get another package, another trillion and a half, well, we would go from about 62% of one quarter's GDP, which is a massive amount of stimulus. If we get four and a half trillion of total stimulus, it'll be about 93%, almost one full quarter's GDP. There, nothing like this has ever occurred. This is a massive amount of fiscal stimulus and it needs to be paid for. And the US government doesn't run a primary surplus. We run a budget deficit. And when you run a budget deficit, you have to issue debt to fill the gap. And that's what we're gonna talk about next. The consequences of all the money printing and all the debt issuance are real and they're likely to be with us for a while. They're persistent. Let me, let me start with um, the a list of what I think the longer term implications are. Number one, this is obvious, higher deficits, higher debt levels. The national debt is exploding. Deficits are gonna be 18% of GDP this year, they usually hover around two to 5%. So huge budget deficit, huge debt. How do you pay for a budget deficit in the long run? You gotta raise taxes, taxes lower growth. The implications of the money printing are a larger monetary base. And frankly, lower growth typically leads to lower nominal interest rates, but a larger monetary base typically leads to higher inflation. You put those two things together, and by the way, they interact um, there, one doesn't just happen in a vacuum. Typically with higher inflation, you're gonna get higher nominal interest rates. So in equilibrium, if there's expectations in the market that inflation will rise, the nominal yields will rise as well. The combination, by the way, of low nominal yields plus higher inflation does produce negative real interest rates. This is an important point. We're gonna talk a lot about it. So again, just to put some numbers on what the uh, consequences are, the monetary base in the US has exploded. It was around 3 trillion and went to 5 trillion in the last couple of months, and it could go to 7.4 if we get uh, additional uh, balance sheet expansion from the Fed. So the monetary base or the Fed's balance sheet is exploding. The GDP or uh, the debt to GDP, or in this case, we're looking at an annual deficit to GDP Going back to 1940 in the World War II period, we did have one larger deficit, budget deficit. It was close to minus 27%, but right now the CBO projects a budget deficit in 2020 or for fiscal 2020 of almost 18%. We should get back to something more normalized, but it's gonna take, it's going to take years to get back to something more normalized here. So the monetary base is exploding and deficits, which means the debt are increasing. Is it inflationary? That's the question. If you, if you explode the monetary base, 
quantity theory of money says that that should raise prices, all else equal. Deficits, are, is the debt sustainable? These are the questions investors have. These are the questions that matter when you're trying to think about how to allocate assets going forward. Just a really quick uh, review of the quantita uh, quantity theory of money. All it says is that prices follow money. You've got monetary base in the upper left-hand corner. That's M. It's exploding, as you can see. You've got uh, real GDP in the upper right-hand corner. You've got money velocity in the bottom left and projected US inflation based on the other elements is prices, which suggests that given the rise in the monetary base, given the increase in GDP, uh, which is uh, the decline in GDP, given the decline in velocity of money, you've got um, uh, an outlook for prices and inflation that is off the charts. So P looks to be uh, rising to plus 16%. Again, this is the monetary or the quantity theory of money. It's the basis upon which all monetarist theory is, uh, it rests upon. Uh, it has some assumptions that are probably not uh, useful uh, in the real world, which is that volatility is assumed to be constant, which it obviously isn't. You can see that in the bottom left. And it also suggests that money is, has little or no effect on real output in the short run, I hope it does because that's the basis for Fed policy. The Fed injects money in, into the system to try and stabilize or increase real GDP, but in the long run, money has no impact on real GDP, so that does hold. But the point is the supply of money in the economy is the thing that determines prices all else equal. The supply of money has exploded. What about debt levels? This is a long-term history of US debt to GDP. You like to look at debt uh, as a percent of the income that can be used to pay down the debt, which in a country's case like the US is gross domestic product. So US debt normalized for GDP peaked at almost 120% back in World War II. It declined pretty dramatically and steadily. And this is important. This period here will be important later in the, in the webinar, down to 31% at the beginning of the 1980s. It's steadily risen as we've basically run budget deficits. We had a bit of a surplus here in the late 90s that caused debt to uh, decline. But in the great financial, in the aftermath of the great financial crisis, debt exploded again. We're at 110%, probably going to 140 by the end of this year. And a good estimate of where we might uh, top out is something closer to 160%. By the way, the Bank for International Settlements or the BIS suggests that when you get to debt to GDP levels greater than 85 or 90% in a typical country, it has negative implications for growth and it increases the country's uh, exposure to external vulnerabilities that might result in either a currency crisis or other kind of a financial crisis. The US should be able to run higher than the, the average country. Again, we're, we have the reserve currency, but still when you get to levels like 140, 150% of debt to GDP, well, I think it's important to take a hard look at that. It does dampen growth, it increases risks. So the government should find a way to reduce the debt in order to reduce exposure to exogenous economic shocks. That's the point of financial repression. But it's only possible to reduce debt. This is, this is important. This is how you get to financial repression. How can you reduce debt? By growing your way out of it, but if we have a high level of debt uh, and debt impedes growth, that's difficult. Plus our potential output here in the United States is challenged by both demographic issues uh, and low uh, investment in, in the capital stock, so lower total factor of productivity. Our potential GDP is lower. So growing our way out of it is not number one in terms of my view of how we're gonna do it. Adjustment means fiscal adjustment. That means balancing the budget. So raising taxes or reducing expenditure on, uh, on government services. That's not a very popular way to do it. In fact, it's really politically unpopular. You could default, that's even more unpopular from a bondholder's perspective. And the US has never defaulted on its debt technically. Uh, so default is not an option. Now there's a, a school of thought that suggests that you can inflate your way out of the debt by letting inflation run hot and then paying down the debt 10 years later with inflated tax revenues. And that does work. Uh, unfortunately, in the meantime, if you have inflation and it raises your debt servicing costs, that is if all overall interest rates rise and you roll over your debt and you have to pay more for the debt and you have a much higher debt bubble, then it's likely that inflation will not work. You need to keep a keep a lid on nominal interest rates, but let inflation run hot. Again, we saw earlier, that means negative real interest rates. Are there any other ways? I just kind of described one. So higher debt levels, lower growth rates, increasing vulnerability. We need to deal with the debt. Uh, 
So we're going to talk now about debt sustainability and how does financial repression fit into this. Krugman says advanced economies with stable governments can borrow at very high levels without a crisis in their own currency. Good news, the US only issues debt in its local currency, the US dollar. So, and we are an advanced economy with a stable government. So we can deal with higher levels of debt than other countries, but we still wanna make sure that these debt levels don't become unmanageable. And the problem with debt levels, whether it's the US or any other country is, there is a limit, but you don't know what it is and you won't know until you get there. And the indicator is a currency crisis or other kind of exogenous shock that highlights that you're, uh, you don't have the degrees of freedom you need to respond to a crisis. So you, you need to put yourself just like a household would um, in a better financial position and the government's got to do something. Let me put some fine points on exactly what, uh, what it means to have a high debt level. So here's three charts. The one on the left is the total government debt. So this is the national debt outstanding in nominal terms. It's almost 27 uh, trillion, almost 27 trillion. And a bunch of that's come in the last uh, year with the uh, issuance related to the stimulus and the federal fiscal stimulus. The second chart is the average interest rate paid on the debt. This is important. If this one is increasing, if government debt is increasing, you need the interest rate paid on debt to decrease to keep the third chart, which is the dollars of interest paid on the debt, stable. As you can see, at least in the last couple of years, even though interest costs have declined, they kind of ticked up a little bit in 2018, interest payments on debts have continued to increase because the amount of government debt has overwhelmed the lower rate of interest. The only thing you can control in a world where you need to have as much fiscal stimulus as we have had and need, the only thing you can do to maintain your debt sustainability is to balance the budget so that the debt continues to grow at a slower rate or in fact declines or attempt to control the interest paid on your debt. That's the only way that you can keep the dollars of interest paid on debt from becoming a huge line item on the budget, crowding out other policy priorities like healthcare or law enforcement or national, uh, national defense. So there's no other way to do it. So how do we balance the budget? Well, what we really need to do is balance the primary budget. We don't need to balance the whole overall budget. The primary budget is the overall budget plus interest payments. So governments like the United States run a budget deficit and we need to maintain access to capital markets to fund that shortfall. Excessive budget deficits increase risk and debt increase economic risk. So it's better to keep deficits manageable. Interest payments can be a significant part of the problem. The most direct route to maintaining stable debt metrics, I said it before, I'll say it again, balance the primary budget but that means cutting expenses and expenditures on services or raising taxes, neither of which is politically uh, easy to do. And in fact, in an election year, it's almost impossible to talk about balancing the budget if you want to be elected. So uh, raise taxes, reduce expenditures, cap interest payments on debt, get to a balanced budget. But it's important to note that e with the high level of debts that we currently have, a primary budget surplus is not a sufficient condition for debt sustainability. You need to do something else. Here's the history, by the way, of the primary and overall budget deficits here in the United States going back to the 60s. The overall surplus or deficit is the orange line. It's averaged um, you know, about 3%-ish, uh, minus minus 3%. We've run a budget deficit of about 3% on average since the 60s. The primary budget deficit which doesn't include interest payments on the debt, was actually in surplus. You're still gonna pay interest on the debt, which is the green bar, that's net interest payments. The gray bars are uh, the primary, the primary sur surplus in this case, but mostly it's a deficit. And as you can see, we were in a significant primary budget deficit in the post uh, great financial period. We're actually getting a little better here until 2016. And then things started to unravel a bit and they're gonna decline dramatically. This 4.6 number is gonna be minus 18%. For 2020. All of that will be uh, composed of a primary budget deficit because interest payments don't change that much year to year. But once you explode the debt, then the interest payments that you're, you pay, as you roll the debt over at higher interest levels and at higher uh, base level, that is there's a higher level of debt and higher interest rate, those things combine to increase the net interest expense. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about debt sustainability. I mentioned that a primary budget surplus is not a sufficient uh, condition for debt sustainability. Here's an equation. This is the IMF's debt sustainability equation. 
it says that changes in debt from year to year, dt minus dt minus one is the change in level of debt from time t to min time t minus one. So that's the increase in the debt over the period is a function of the primary budget surplus or deficit at time t, PBT is the primary budget surplus or deficit. And it's also a function of the interest payments versus overall economic growth times the, uh, the debt level in the prior period. R is the real rate of interest. This is the thing that we're trying to control for. Growth, a growth in the economy is the real rate of GDP growth. That helps. If you have high interest rates, but you have higher growth than interest rates, then you will reduce your debt level all else equal. You need interest rates to be lower than economic growth. Okay, that's the key. When, in, when growth is greater than or equal to the rate of interest, you can see from this part of the equation, if, if R is, uh, is less than G, then this is a positive uh, L, a factor in the equation. And if this is positive, you multiply that by the debt level, it actually indicates a lower level of debt assuming that the you're in prim primary budget surplus is zero. So it, growth greater than interest rates, debt to GDP stabilizes or falls. When growth is less than interest rates, that was when GDP growth is below the rate of interest, debt to GDP rises. Interest rates, lower is better. Nominal GDP growth, higher is better. Prior, uh, primary budget deficit, positive is better. So we need, just to put a fine point on this slide, uh, growth to be greater than interest rates. If growth is greater than your interest rate, you can stabilize your debt. Key feature. Or the other way to say that, by the way, is interest rates less than growth. So I just flipped that around from the prior slide. We need interest rates to be less than growth. You need to cap interest rates. So that's financial repression. Financial repression are policies that artificial lower a government's cost of borrowing to maintain debt sustainability. That's why you do it. There's no other reason behind, or no other government rationale for debts for, for financial repression policies, except the, the government is trying to maintain lower debt service costs and to maintain debt sustainability. It can be accomplished very efficiently if your real interest rates are less than economic growth. Reducing government debt levels happens very efficiently with real interest rates, R bar, less than economic growth. G. What is the best way to make R bar less than G? You repress nominal interest rates and increase inflation. The best way to make real interest rates less than growth is twofold. In plain English, repress nominal interest rates and increase inflation, which is another way of saying produce negative real interest rates. The government is highly motivated to pursue policies that generate negative real interest rates in order to maintain debt sustainability. The fact is, what you need for debt sustainability is simply real interest rates less than growth. If you can get real interest rates negative, the debt reduction process is turbocharged by negative real interest rates. Negative real interest rates are almost the same as adding a revenue line item to the, to the government's budget you can almost balance your budget effectively with negative real interest rates. It's a, it's a, a function, it's, a, it's just math, negative real interest rates, turbocharge debt, debt reduction. So what do you need? Low nominal interest rates. What's better than low? Negative real interest rates. Just to be sure what we're all talking about here, right now, the US Treasury nominal yield, this is as of last week, was about 68 basis points. Nominal just means it's not adjusted for inflation. Adjusting nominal yields for inflation is straightforward. Here's the equation. Nominal interest rates, which is 68 bips on the 10-year treasury, minus inflation equals real interest rates. The current numbers are, using as an example the US, 68 bips nominal. Inflation is 1.76%. Okay, that's PCE equals a negative real interest. Actually, that's five-year uh, inflation break-evens from TIPS, 176 bips equals 108 basis points negative, 1.08% negative real interest rates, which is what we see. If you were to buy a 10-year tip today, it would pay you 1.8% negative for the next 10 years in real rates. So how can we reduce levels of debt? It can only be done through these features, these policies, or a policy of financial repression combined with inflation. You have to, you have to use a little bit of inflation but you can't just let inflation go because nominal interest rates will rise in equilibrium. 
So financial repression policies cap nominal interest rates at a low level below inflation. So inflation is greater than nominal interest rates. And that's just another way of saying negative interest rates. So financial repression, nominal rates are repressed, get to negative real interest rates. And that allows the government to liquidate the real value of the debt. Have we done this before? Yes, I'll talk about that in a second. So what are the strategies that allow you to repress nominal interest rates and allow inflation to run a little bit hotter than normal? Okay, the financial repression strategies playbook looks just like this. First, ah, actually I'd flip these two. We've already done quantitative easing. We may get to yield curve control. Quantitative easing is the Federal Reserve's purchase of government bonds, which they increase demand from a non-economic buyer with unlimited purchasing power, which is the Fed, has a will, all else equal, cap interest rates at a particular level. Now, the specific goals of quantitative easing aren't to cap interest rates out the curve. The Fed generally plays in the less than one year part of the, uh, the curve, uh, buying and selling securities for their own account in order to manage the Fed funds rate. So the Fed funds is the short-term overnight rate that banks charge each other for, for overnight deposits. That's where the Fed generally plays is in Fed funds, very low maturity, very short duration assets. But with quantitative, quantitative easing, you can go out the curve and buy two and five and 10 and even longer dated securities. But the purpose of it isn't to cap the yield on those securities. The purpose of going out that far is actually to continue to promote the proper liquid functioning of the capital markets, particularly the bond market. That's what QE does. It's to, to promote liquidity in the bond market. Yield curve control is subtly different. It's implemented exactly the same way. The Federal Reserve buys US Treasury securities in the five, two, five, 10, seven year, whatever, out the curve beyond one year in an attempt, in an explicit attempt, yield curve control is an explicit attempt to cap yields at a particular level. Well, we need yields capped at a level below the inflation rate. So yield curve control is perfectly suited to that. It's not part of the Fed's toolkit. I suspect they will announce it if they need to. They're certainly going to continue to purchase bonds using QE. They may never uh, announce yield curve control. Japan did four years ago. It's working just fine there. Uh, QE, on the other hand, is a policy that's already been understood, is well understood. They may just modify it to become yield curve control. That's what I anticipate. So you cap nominal interest rates, but you still have to increase the rate of inflation. Uh, let's talk about that on the next slide, but creation or maintenance of a captive domestic market. So right now the Fed's buying all the debt. If the Fed for some reason can't buy enough debt to keep rates capped, the government can change the regulatory framework for the commercial banking system by increasing liquidity requirements or reserve requirements, which force banks to purchase more US Treasury securities. This is what Japan did. They've been pursuing financial repression for 25 years in Japan. The US can do the same thing and create a captive domestic market for government debt through macroprudential policies by altering the terms of the agreement uh, of financial regulation. So it's called macroprudential policies. Uh, the, the Fed manages the banks or manages the regulatory environment for the banks. They can simply mandate that the banks buy more debt. That's what they'll do. So there's a, there's a well-trod uh, pathway of getting to financial repression. All of these things are within the Fed's purview uh, and they're being implemented already. So the Fed is gonna do most of it. They're doing it now. The Fed is pegged short rates to inter uh, short interest rates. That's the Fed funds rate to zero. They're capping nominal interest rates. They're allowing inflation to run hot. I'll talk about that in a second. The treasury could help uh, by getting together with the Fed to improve the macro prudential policy uh, framework and the commercial banking system. Those are next steps. If we can't get financial repression done by the Federal Reserve alone, there's a plan B. Let's look at the scorecard and see where we are in terms of uh, implementing financial repression policies. We went to short, uh, we took the short Fed funds rate to zero back in March. So we're already there. Fed funds current and market-based expectations for the, for the Fed is uh, zero out until 2023. So the Fed has smash packed the Fed funds rate, their typical policy tool, the easiest one to control, they took to zero instantaneously back in March to was their first uh, shot across the bow to try to resurrect the bond market. Capping nominal interest rates out the curve, I'm gonna show you a bigger version of this slide in a second, but just to suggest um, what the Fed's uh, buying from the treasury. The Fed's balance sheet is composed of less than one year, one to five year, and five to 10 year securities. The Fed usually plays here, but 
quantitative easing and the potential for yield curve control has uh, allowed a substantial amount of purchases in the Federal Reserve's uh, account uh, in treasury securities greater than one, one to five and five to 10 years. So they're absolutely doing that. And that has caused the 10 year yield to collapse to multi generational, in fact, multi century lows. So the Fed's already doing it. The Fed is capping nominal interest rates out the curve by buying treasury securities out the curve. And here's the new news um, How is the Fed going to allow inflation to run hot? Two weeks ago at the Jackson Hole. Uh, the Kansas City Fed's Jackson Hole Monetary Policy Meeting was virtual this year, announced that the Fed's reaction function is gonna change from one of a trigger to one of a, uh, or a ceiling to one of average inflation targeting. So AIT is average inflation targeting. It means that historically the Fed would um, see inflation, PCE core inflation rising to 2%. And as soon as it hit 2%, the Fed would raise interest rates, even if inflation was running well below 2% for an extended period of time there's a problem for the Fed when, when that is allowed to happen. When inflation runs well below the Fed's 2% target, it starts to seep into the decision-making process of households and businesses. And when it does, it becomes embedded in prices across uh, all goods and services. That unfortunately, the Fed, you might say, well, what's bad about having lower inflation? And the answer is the Fed wants to have a cushion of inflation that they can use if when the next recession comes in order to lower interest rates further, that is inflation feeds into the nominal Fed funds rate. And they would like to see nominal Fed funds rate closer to 4% than zero, which is where they are now. Because once you're at zero, you can't lower the nominal Fed funds rate and you have to do non-traditional monetary or unconventional monetary policy like quantitative easing. So once you get to the effective lower bound, your degrees of freedom as a, as a central bank are reduced. So the Fed has, has always wanted to get Fed funds back to three or 4%, just so they can reduce them to zero again and make it have an impact. Reducing Fed funds from one to zero is much less impactful than reducing them from four to zero in a recession. So they want that free board, they want that buffer, and they haven't been able to get it. This is how they're gonna try and get it. They're gonna let the unemployment rate go below what they thought was Nehru. They're not gonna focus on the Phillips curve any longer. I'll talk about the Phillips curve in a second, but just know this, very dovish what the Fed announced. And it's a, it's a regime shift in terms of the Fed's inflation reaction function. And inflation expectations have, have responded accordingly. We'll see another bigger chart on this uh, next. So again, the financial repression scorecard is pretty clear. It says that short rates are at zero, nominal yields are capped, inflation expectations rising, job done. So again, this is the chart from the prior page. And it just highlights the fact that historically the Fed played in the short part of the curve and had about a half a trillion. This is uh, the change in the Federal Reserve's holdings since the beginning of the year. The Fed's bought a half a trillion of uh, very short dated uh, securities, but they bought one and a half trillion of longer dated securities. That used to be a non-traditional policy, but now it seems to be the, um, the Fed's typical operating framework is to buy outside of one year and even greater than five year security. So most of the securities the Fed has bought haven't been in the typical front end of the yield curve. It's been in the, the one to 10 year, 1.5 trillion have been in the one to 10 year bucket. Just to put a fine point on it, again, this is the Federal Reserve's holdings as of the beginning of the great financial crisis. The Fed's holdings were, 75% of them were concentrated in the less than five year bucket and only 20% or so were in the five to, five years and beyond. But now the Federal Reserve Treasury holdings as of uh, two weeks ago, much more, much more of the Fed holdings, much less are in the front end, much more in the, in the back end. So the Fed is absolutely uh, pursuing some sort of yield curve capping process just by vir virtue of examining their holdings, they're buying stuff out the curve. So um, it's now a much larger percent. What's been the effect? The effect is US Treasury 10 year nominal yields have collapsed. So this is 230 years of history. The US Treasury yield curve going back to the 1790s. 10 year yields peaked at 14% in 1980, 1981, and they've come down in a secular decline since then. Here's the last four years. They've averaged about 2%. By the way, for 230 years, 10 year Treasury yields averaged almost 5%. If you're averaging 5%, that's a nice buffer. It's good income you can do something with that. If you're averaging 2% even for the last four years, that's something, but we're at 69 basis points, 70 basis points on 10-year treasuries. 
this isn't just a generational low or my career low, but the 10 year treasury is trading at a multi-century low of interest rates. This is nominal interest rates. It's a lot easier to get negative when the nominal rate is this low and it is, it's this low. Okay, let's talk about the history of financial repression in the US real quick. And we'll talk about what to do about all of this financial repression and negative real interest rates. The US actually pursued aggressive financial repression back in the World War II period, subsequent to the war. It effectively began in the of 1941. December of 1941, Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. We got, we got into World War II. We've ramped up production. The government ran massive budget deficits and the Federal Reserve and the Treasury had a meeting in the middle of December of 1941 and they decided to collude on interest rates. Kind of like they're doing now. Back in D41, the US encouraged the Federal Reserve to keep interest rates low. And they actually formalized the arrangement in April of 1942. It took 90 days for the Treasury to convince the Fed to give up their independence. But the Fed decided that they would um, go along to support the war effort and to allow the government to fund the war effort. And they pegged interest rates at 3 eighths on the short end and two and a half on the long end. We're already well below that now. We're at zero on the front end or an eighth of a point on the front end. And cap and long-term yields are already down to uh, 70 basis points. So jobs are already being done for them by, by the Fed and by the market. It wasn't until 1951 when the Fed and the Treasury decided to uh, reestablish Fed independence and allow the Fed to resume independent monetary policy by, by raising interest rates in the aftermath of the, uh, the Korean War. So just to, but having said that, the Fed continued to support lower interest rates and inflation ran at a particular level that you could say with a high degree of confidence that financial repression, which is the combination of those two things, lasted for nearly 35 years. Let's talk about negative real interest rates going back to the 1820s here in the United States. And you can see there was prior to the understanding of what money could do to prices, pre-monetarist theories, there was a bunch of random inflation spikes. This is World War I right here. This is World War II here in Korea. These, in, these are negative real interest rates that resulted from, from spiking inflation primarily. It wasn't, it wasn't planned going back pre-World War I, but it was planned post-World War uh, II and after the Korean crisis up until the early 80s. And that we can call a period of financial repression. What happened to debt to GDP? Well, in the pre- World War II period, debt to GDP was at 50%. In the immediate aftermath of World War II, we saw earlier debt to GDP in the US peaked at 119%. The, the US pursued financial repression policies that reduced real interest rates to very low levels. And in fact, they were on average negative from 1941 until 1980. And that negative real interest rate is what liquidated in such a smooth and stable fashion debt to GDP here in the US until we got to 30% in 1981. So it's, no, it's not an exaggeration. Financial repression is what got the US out of the debt bubble that we created in the post-World War II period. We're heading right back to 140% or above. We're gonna be right about here or above in terms of debt to GDP and interest rates are, are, have already gone very negative and they're likely to remain negative for a long period of time because the government is interested in replicating the experience that happened in the post-World War II period and, and by creating uh, financial oppression and negative real interest rates. Here's more about negative real interest rates. On the left is the last 100 years, and on the right is the last 20 years. So again, we had these low real or negative, uh, low or negative real interest rates during the period in the post-World War II period. They're much higher in the 80s and 90s, of course. And now here we are in the knots. They've come down considerably. TIPS were actually invented, Treasury Inflation Protection Bonds, a couple of years before this. And they actually, the first issuance of TIPS was at a three and a half or almost, or maybe it might've been three and three quarters real yield back in Jan of 97. So you had real interest rates in the US at about 4% at the beginning of the knots. In the aftermath of the great financial crisis, you had very low nominal rates and that inflation took real rates to below zero for a while, but we're right back there now. We haven't seen higher real rates since, and we're not likely to see higher uh, real rates anytime in the future until we can get our debt levels down. So here we are, we're already at minus 105 basis points, deeply negative territory. A Couple of quick charts uh, and then we'll wrap it up. This is the forward curve for three months treasuries, and this is the forward curve for 10-year treasuries. 
basically it says, what is three month yields gonna be in 2023? And the answer is the market is currently pricing in no Fed funds rate hikes until at least 2023. That's what the forward curve is telling you in three month rates. In terms of 10 year yields, they're not budging for at least a couple of years and probably not until 2023 when um, 10 year yields are forecast to be still uh, much less than half of the average for the last uh, 230 years. And this curve, I anticipate both of these curves are likely to be just a, a rolling, you know, two year, they'll keep moving out uh, as we keep getting into uh, further and further down the calendar. You'll see that this will be, uh, you know, 120 will not, will not be the 2023 expectation, but it'll be 2025 in a year or two that will just continuously keep pushing out higher interest rates uh, and hence interest rates, nominal interest rates will be lower for longer. That's just, that's, that's necessary. It's a, it's a feature of financial repression and it's necessary for debt sustainability. The other thing that you need for debt sustainability is inflation expectations to be higher. And this is uh, average CP, PCE core. PCE core is the Fed's preferred inflation measure. Average PCE core was 1.6% for the last 10 years, which is well below the Fed's target. It's why they did average inflation targeting is because they didn't want 1.6% inflation to be embedded in household decision-making and consumer and uh, commercial decision-making. So what do we got now? Well, with the announcement of average inflation targeting and frankly with the expectation, we've been expecting it since the Fed announced their Fed listens project back in February of 2019, that they would be reworking the inflation framework somehow uh, inflation expectations have continued to rise. Realized inflation is finally above 1% now, but there's still this gap. Realized inflation is lagging inflation expectations. Inflation expectations are what's embedded in TIPS products. Realized inflation is just the, uh, the actual PCE core print. There's still a pretty wide gap here between realized inflation and inflation expectations. So we anticipate inflation expectations, uh, realized inflation will catch up to inflation expectations and inflation expectations are likely to rise to 2%. So they're highly correlated, these two things. So inflation is likely to go higher. A uh, couple more things about what the Fed is thinking about and how they usually make decisions. They usually make decisions based on something called the, the, the um, Phillips curve. The Phillips curve was invented by a British economist 50 years ago, it basically said, if you have low unemployment, you're gonna have high inflation, that is, low unemployment rates, which means there's no slack in the labor markets, that is bottlenecks. Bottlenecks in the labor market cause wages to rise and with higher wages, companies need to raise prices to pay the higher wages and that feeds into the inflation rate. So the original Phillips curve was actually unemployment on the horizontal axis and wage, wages on the vertical, but it's been converted to central bank usage by including what is the central bank's primary reaction uh, macro uh, factor, which is the inflation rate. So you've got the inflation rate here, again, unemployment rate low, inflation high, that's what the theoretical Phillips curve tells you. Unfortunately, the actual Phillips curve from 1990 for the last 30 years looks more like this. So the Federal Reserve basically said, the move to average inflation targeting is a reflection of the fact that unemployment rates could go really low and inflation would stay low too. So it flattened it. Instead of having this nice little uh, convex curve here, it's really much flatter. And if the, Phillips curve is as if the Phillips curve is flatter, you can have much lower unemployment rates and it won't feed through into inflation. So they can leave rates lower for longer. That's exactly what the Fed is saying by going to average inflation targeting. They were very explicit. They're going to let unemployment rate go lower than the, what they thought was Nehru, the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. They're gonna let it go very much lower, probably three and a half or 4% again, which is kind of where we were pre-COVID. And, and that didn't produce a high level of inflation. So, so we should expect that the Fed is not gonna react like they normally do based on Phillips curve uh, arguments. Average inflation targeting makes it okay. By announcing average inflation targeting, they basically said the Phillips curve is probably dead for now. And that's, that's fine. It hasn't worked really well for the last 10 years. A lot of Fed conferences focus on the fact that the Phillips curve is in, hi Phillips curve is in hibernation. Well, it's in hibernation for sure. You can tell just by this chart. So there's no, there's no smooth line that relates unemployment to inflation. So the Fed is finally recognizing that and they're gonna let inflation run hot. Uh, they're not gonna respond. They're gonna let it average over a period of time. It'll probably go as high as two and a quarter, maybe 2.4%, something like that, before the Fed reacts. Uh, 
uh, and it depends on how fast it gets there and how long it's been there. So there's a lot of uncertainty. We're probably going to get some more clarity on it after the September FOMC meeting. I suspect that there'll be a lot of talk in the announcement and in the press conference afterwards to elaborate on average inflation targeting. But the one takeaway for sure, inflation is going to run hotter than it has in the past. So uh, very important to include this chart twice because it's the most important thing. Nominal treasury rates, 10 years, 70 basis points, negative interest rates in the United States, 10 year yields, minus 1%, 100 basis points negative. You hold a 10 year, uh, any bond that has negative real interest rates for a period of time, you're guaranteeing yourself a loss of purchasing power over that period. And that is what makes the current environment so challenging. There aren't a lot of positive real yields available. There are some, we can skip the muni yields on the left, just look at corporate bond real yields. The five-year treasury real yield is minus 145. You saw the 10 years minus 105. The five-year real yield is minus 145. Corporate, you have to go out to triple B corporate bonds before you get a positive real yield based on inflation expectations. If you really want to take some credit risk, you can get some decent real yields, which is why we're advocating moving out the credit curve. The, the Fed is supporting the bond market in general and investment grade corporate credit in particular, and high yield bonds are benefiting from that as well. So you, if, you, if you have the capability of moving down the credit spectrum, you can absolutely get positive real yields. It's something that we're, we're recommending now. So let's just summarize what the game plan is. No matter what financial repression means, there's going to be increased cooperation between the government and the US banking system, primarily through the Federal Reserve. Set short rates to zero, you cap long real interest rates using QE and yield curve control. You let inflation run. And I believe Michael froze there for, for just a moment. So um, we'll, we'll finish up with, um, you know, the, the, the game plan. And as we were discussing here, uh, a lot of this comes back to our uh, connecting our uh, investment goals, the entities and consultants getting together, reevaluating in this type of investment environment as the, as the government executes on this financial repression game plan. It's important for us to, to reevaluate those investment objectives. Think about the, 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 the cash flow, the spending, uh, um, uh, how we address our spending policies and our investment objectives, uh, how inflation goes into that, and, and, and really the different asset classes that we identify in our investment policy statements. For instance, with many uh, in with many nonprofit institutions, we address these uh, these spending policies, asset allocation, investment objectives are all are all um, included in, in a policy. We need to reevaluate those, we reevaluate investment objectives, but also the asset classes. So fixed income for a long time gave you an anchor to the volatility that equities provide in a, can, can create in a portfolio. And you didn't have to pay that much for it because you actually got a, a decent fixed income return or a real return uh, over inflation. In this environment that Michael Dow has laid out for us today, we don't have uh, that, that same real return positive um, impact out of fixed income. We need to address that. He talked about addressing that with real assets. There's a number of ways we should be doing that. What's important to know is that in executing a, an investment um, an investment game plan for your portfolio uh, with your consultant is to, is to think about the impact this has uh, across the board from our asset allocation to our spending and, and, and the way we term our uh, investment goals in a policy statement. With that, uh, that concludes our uh, discussion, and uh, I'd like to, to thank everyone for the, uh, the opportunity uh, to, to speak with you today on behalf of Michael Dow, on behalf of Beacon Point. Uh, thank you for joining us today. If you wish to uh, ask any follow-up questions or, or um, anything related to this topic, please uh, feel free to reach out to, to Beacon Point at our uh, information line, info at beaconpoint.com or you can reach me directly at mbreller, M-B-R-E-L-L-E-R at beaconpoint.com or our main line, 949-718-1600. Again, thank you for your time. I see that Michael Dow has joined us back today. Um, that concludes our webinar. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>